Aspects of Writing. I'm your co-host, Janet Corsi, and today we also have Joyce Gatchenberger as our co-host. And we're sitting in for James Kelly, who is missing. <sighs> well, the topic of today's show is African American Influence in Literature, and I think I'm going to get a heck of an education today. Our special mm-hmm. guest is Judith C. Owens Lalaudi. Joyce, please introduce Joyce. Uh, Judith, please. Judith. We, we have a lot <laughs> There's of There's too Judith many J's today. in this room. <laughs> we have Jan, Judith, and Joyce. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to read her bio today because I think that in, introduces her and she will inform us certainly today. Um, Judith C. Owens Lalude is an author, an artist, a dramatist, a writer, a publicist, a public speaker, a folklorist, and a storyteller. She's a native of Louisville, Kentucky. She has over 35 years' experience conducting workshops, seminars, and classes for adults, teens, and children interested in writing, and she's interested in writing for young people. Uh, She is a graduate of Kentucky State University, where she earned a Bachelor's of Science degree. Later, she moved to Southern California and earned a Master's degree in education at California State University at Long Beach. In addition to her degrees, Judith has a lifetime certificate in adult education from California Department of Education, and she's received certification in multimedia communication arts. Judith is married to A. Otayo Lalude, who is a physician, and she has two sons. Wow. My goodness. <laughs> that what means we're going to have a good time today. Yes, we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so, um, what I'd like to do is also uh, have uh, Judith inform us, not so much about uh, maybe authorship, but maybe about a history of African Americans and what their contribution was to the writing experience. So, uh, Judith, would you give us a little bit of intro into that? Yes, I'd love to. Thank you, uh, Joyce. Well, let's start with this is. 2019. 400 years ago, the first Africans arrived here at the British colony. We call it Jamestown today. There was the arrival of 20 and odd Africans in late August of 1619. They were aboard a Dutch ship as reported by John Raffe, but an English, but an English but an English warship, White Lion. And I say that, White Lion, an English warship. It was sailing with a letter of Marquet issued by the English captain, Jopé, by a Protestant Dutch prince. The letter legally permitted the White Lion to sail as a privateer attacking any Spanish and Portuguese ship it encountered. The 20 and odd Africans were captives among, uh, were captives removed from the pe- Portuguese slave ship San Juan Batista. Following an encounter the ship had with the White Lion and her consort, the treasurer, another English ship, while attempting to deliver African prisoners to Mexico. Rolfe reporting the White Lion as a Dutch warship was a clever way to transfer Mm. blame away from the English for piracy of the slave ship to the Dutch. And you'll read very often that Captain Joe J-O-P-E, was sailing a Dutch man or warship, but actually he was not. He was sailing that British ship, White Mm. Lion, so uh, that kind of got history off to a uh, interesting start. But now it sounds we like. know. So, so now we've got the report straight, and we're ready to talk about the first Africans who arrived. And guess what? They were not slaves. They were, That's interesting. They were kidnapped, and they were indentured servants. It wasn't until about 40 years later that they entered into uh, slavery because the um, the the British who had come, the settlers, found out quickly 
cheap, cheap labor was good, but free labor mm-hmm. was better. And so 40 years later, they passed a law recognizing slavery. That's incredible. Now, did any of these, because uh, they were on their way to Mexico, did any of them ever make it to Mexico? Oh, there are uh, slaves can, uh, and Africans can be documented in Africa back to about 1400. My gosh. The uh, first Africans kidnapped from Nigeria, it was about 1440. My God. And that was by uh, the uh, Portuguese. My heavens. Well, let me read a little bit uh, about the slave narrative, and I'm so glad that you shared with everyone about the indentured servant Mm -hmm. being the first um, way that Africans came to not only the United States, but a lot of other territories. Mm -hmm. The slave narrative is a type of literary work that is made up of the written accounts of enslaved Africans in Great Britain and its colonies, including the latter United States, Canada, and the Caribbean nations, some 6,000 former slaves from North America and the Caribbean gave accounts of their lives during the 18th and 19th centuries, with more than 150 narratives published as separate books or pamphlets. In the U.S. during the Great Depression in the 1930s, more than 2,300 additional oral histories on life during slavery were collected by writers sponsored and published by the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration. Most of the 26 audio recorded interviews are held by the Library of Congress. And my sense is those narratives, if they had not been done, would have lost, been lost to uh, the accounts of these writers and these people that were indentured slaves, indentured servants and slaves. Yes, those uh, those narratives have been invaluable to writers like myself who are interested in writing historical novels and preserving that history. I have I have a quote from one of those uh, narratives. Good, good. From John Wayfield. His age wasn't known. He's from Lafayette, Indiana, which is not far from where I used to live in Mm -hmm. Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. He said it was the law that if a white man was caught trying to educate a Negro slave, he was liable to prosecution entitling a, a fine of $50 and a jail sentence. Our ignorance was the greatest hold the South had on us. We knew we could run away. But what then? Right. They and wouldn't, that's, uh, that's wouldn't be able to read. And what S- I, so you're saying by that that the mm-hmm. white person who already had enslaved their body could also enslave their mind and their spirit by making sure they couldn't read and they couldn't write. That's correct. And they kept books and education away from the enslaved. But what I thought was interesting in this is if the white man was caught educating, they were fined $50. I can remember in uh, in the mid-1800s, if a slave ran away and they were caught, the the petty rollers were paid $50 for each slave caught and brought back. And what is a petty roller, so we can inform everyone? The petty roller were men, usually men, who uh, the... Slave owners would say, my slave ran away, go get him. And they were, they would track the slaves down. Like bounty hunters. Exactly, Mm. exactly. And they weren't kind to them. They could beat them, abuse them, rape them, and then drag them back. But they would not kill them because that was not their property. Right. But they could be near death. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately... Uh, In the same era, I've been reading a lot about uh, the um, South and the development. The value of the slave was held higher money-wise than the value of the land. Is that what you found? Um, Well, what I found was, depending on the sex and the age of the slave, uh, you could pay dearly for a slave, let's say, 18, 25, 
you didn't pay that much for an acre of land. Mm. Uh huh. So the value of the southern so it, plantations mm -hmm. was in the property, the human property that they held. Yes, and if they had uh, slaves that weren't productive, they would tell you in a minute that they could not afford to feed them. Oh. And they would, um, they would sell that slave. Yeah. Well, you know, and they made their money from the free labor they got from the foods and, and the products. Yes, they got their, they, they made their money from the labor of the enslaved. Yeah. Yes, they did. So they didn't want to spend that money feeding them, dressing them, and housing them. So there was always deficiencies yes. in that area, which caused a great deal of suffering on the part of the slave. Oh, my. Well, you know what? That's why we're here to inform people, and I'm so glad those narratives were recorded and we have them down to you. So I know you that you've written a book, so can you give us the name of the book, and can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Uh, this is The Long Walk, Slavery. Can, can you show it to us also? Well, we have it up on, on the screen. Good, good. This is The Long Walk, Slavery to Freedom. The, the book and story itself has an interesting um, lifeline. You never know where a story is going to come from, and you don't always, as an author, know where your book is going to come from. This actually started out to be about a 300-word poem written for children. Oh, my. And I wrote it during a workshop that I was given. So at the end of the workshop, I asked, uh, I had a woman who was a librarian for the elementary schools in Louisville. I said, oh, read this and tell me what you think. She said, oh, it's really good. But a children's book cannot end on a sad note. So they got to the river, and they, Wednesday was the little girl. Caroline was the mother. And they were very sad, and the little girl was crying and what have you. I said, well, when I thought about it, if they don't cross that river, they're not going to be free. So mm -hmm. then it was answering the questions. Why did they run? How were they going to get across the river? And I knew that if they didn't, they wouldn't be free. So I continued to write. I said, well, this is no longer a point. It's a, it was leaning towards a children's picture book. Now it's about 1,500 words. <laughs> and I said, hmm. But it still didn't answer enough of the questions of the whys and the how comes. So I continued to write. And when I finished, I had a novel. Yes. And it was also the research of my own ancestors that kind of spearheaded this. And in the process of researching slavery in North Central Kentucky, I said, oh, wait, this is a story that needs to be told and must be told. And because when I did find my family, they were in, uh, well, the family history kept saying Fairfield, Kentucky. And I said, but they weren't mistreated. They ended up with a slave owner who liked them. Uh, and oh. when, <laughs> when they moved and they left his home, which ended up being in Spencer County, this is a problem you have when you search the county lines, meet yes. each other, and the family didn't know that they were actually enslaved on the other side of the county line. And by the time they knew the information, they were on Nelson, si Nelson County side, not Spencer County side. But anyway, he would go spend the night with them because he missed them. Oh. I said, hmm, this does not an interesting <laughs> book make. I said, but I was so torn by the research I had done, the stories I had read, and what I had learned about slavery. I said, I have got to write this book. But the characters in the book have the names of my ancestors. Oh. Mm -hmm. Because I found when I used my ancestors' names, I became so attached to those characters mm -hmm. that it just kicked my writing up several notches. Yes. Because every time I said George Henry, George Henry was my great-grandfather. So is this book fiction or nonfiction? 
I tell people, this is, this is a historical novel. Historical novel. And I tell people in a heartbeat, you will recognize the truth of the tellings. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So it is not my family history, but it is the history that was uh, done through my research. Uh-huh. And um, one of the examples that I can, I can give you is there was a farmer in Kentucky. He was a salt farmer. And he used to breed uh, slaves. Oh. And uh, he, would, he had a f- three, three or four story house. And on the top story, he had small rooms. And then he would bring the s- young slave girls there. So mm-hmm. I, if when you read, you will see that I have put the girls in a barn. Uh-huh. And uh, they were young. And as soon as they start, sh- uh, as soon as they start showing their uh, their tits and just gotten into puberty, he shoves them into the barn, a bunch of them, and then shoves it into a bunch of boys in, and they're mm-hmm. all naked. Mm-hmm. So the the mother who is telling the story to her daughter says, "The boys seem to know what to do." Nine mm-hmm. months later, you were born. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. So and you know, from the story and research I have done in uh, South, because uh, I spent a lot of time in Mississippi, mm-hmm. that's actually a truth about how things were done during certain period in the South and how things were developed in Southern plantations. Yes, and uh, and that's why I always say you will recognize the truth of the tellings. Yes. And they have been woven into what I feel is a compelling story. And I I just don't say that because I think it's so. I also get that from the feedback of my readers. Mm -hmm. I think they tell the truth. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So when you talk about the African-American narrative, do you find it um, sad? Do you find it uh, written? Do you find it spoken? What do you find? The the they're interesting. The narratives were recorded, so the uh, Africans and Americans are speaking a dialect, and the person who is taking the information and based on the year and when the project were done were probably Anglo-Saxon Americans. Mm. So there's the spelling is by what they hear because these words didn't really exist. Right. Uh, if you remember, the, the, the Africans came with their language, and they weren't speaking English. Right. And English was forced on them, and they, in America, they weren't allowed to speak their language. So the sound of, their la- of the English language is kind of, uh, I'll give you a sample of it later. I'm, I'm going to share some okay. of that dialogue Good. with Good. you. Good, Please but do. But... Those narratives, the importance of them cannot even be over-exaggerated. They are fabulous source of information. You hear those words. You can just imagine those people and feel that you were almost there standing on that plantation with them. But by it being recorded, you can say, we own that story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not going anywhere. Yeah. So I think that that is the best part of it, and as historians and writers, we can build on it, we can weave it, and we can keep passing it on to the next generation, to the next generation. Do you think they will ever make those recordings available to anyone who just wants to hear them? Is this something that, that we can get our hands on? I know that they're printed, whether they are recorded or not, but in today's technology, I would almost have to believe that they mm-hmm. are, but I don't know for sure. That would be something to listen to. Oh, it 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 would be. Yeah. It would be. Well, they're available in the Library of Congress, so yes. anyone, I'm sure, can access them. I don't know if they're available online. They may be have an audio recording, but certainly Library of Congress mm-hmm. makes them available, I'm sure. In visiting the plantations, I've not seen it yet, but technology changes so fast. Yes. And those kinds of things are so easy to do and yeah. have available. Mm-hmm. But uh, the other problem with technology is 
I have the recording, uh, uh, professional recording of the long walk. It was done at the printing house for the blind. Oh. And it is absolutely uh, beautiful. It's very expensive. They're MP3s, they're on disc. But now computers don't even have a disc slot. True. Right. So True. how you get the these uh, audio uh, books now is so totally different and continuously changing. Yes. So yeah. it, now you download it on something and I don't, know if, the, pillar, I don't yeah. know if the government moves as fast as technology moves. That's the bottom line. Okay. I don't think we do. <laughs> <laughs> so when you decided to write your book, did you go the traditional route or did you self-publish, as they say, an indie publisher? Or how did you decide? I self-published. I have my own uh, publishing company. And I had, but what was interesting, is the first time I had it uh, edited, uh, the person who, who did the editing was upset because she did her family history and found out they were abolitionists and thought I should have a little bit more kindness in, in my book. I said, but mm -hmm. I can't because on when the <laughs> slaves are living on a farm, they don't have access to that that. Uh, right. That kindness. They've got to run away and they've got to cross the waters and, and, and. I said, that's not quite the route that my book took. So she had a difficult time editing it. Well, I'm sure. Then I would have, you say, oh, ask someone, oh, could you please read this? Tell me what you think. Do some editing. And they were not really able to edit because they got so caught up in the story. Yes. And they were writing like, oh, no, uh-uh, I'd never take that. Oh, I, oh, no, he couldn't do that to me. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I because said, oh, they were looking from a different viewpoint, as yes, you said. Each story yes, is very different yes. as an author. So, it so how be, did you resolve that? Well, you just, I kept reading and editing and having people to read and edit for me. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you just keep reaching out uh, mm -hmm. and um, until mm -hmm. you decide, well, this is the best that I can make it. Mm -hmm. And then because I am certified, you know, in the multimedia area, I was able to do my own layout and my own book cover. Now, Wonderful. this particular art is not my art. And the reason is because this was the very first book I wrote. And uh, so a young man who went to school with my son, I paid him and he did some artwork for me that I took to a, a conference and so I used that. Mm -hmm. I had I took the book cover to a friend who is a professional artist and had the book cover evaluated. The first book cover is black. It looks a little different. And uh, I said, tell me, is this okay? He says, yes. So the next thing I had to do, I sent it to a professor on the West Coast and a professor on the East Coast mm. to tell me, would young people, young adults, college kids, pick this book up and read it based on the book cover? And they both said they would. I oh. said, okay. So then I went the next step, making sure the interior was laid out properly and what have you. So after I did that, and I tell, I tell all my writers, you have to continue to reinvent yourself. You have to continue to grow yourself. Mm -hmm. I put me in school and learned to do digital art. So now Wonderful. Uh, so I can do all my book covers. And well, I think <laughs> the, the picture is brilliant. Yes. Yes, he it's did very a well wonderful done. job. He was just out of high school. Maybe he was at the uh, University of Louisville at that time. Hmm. So and I and I've got uh several. Um I can show you a couple of more that he did. That's that one. Well, remember, we are radio. Yes. Oh, <laughs> radio. Uh-oh. Radio, you can see two drummers sitting by the fireplace, and then at the end, you can see what I call the uh, Alleluia dancing, dancers, mm. celebrating. They've crossed the water. They've made it to freedom. Um, that the, would make me dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other... Um, the other point that I had to take into consideration when I write, I don't write for an individual. I write for the whole family. Uh -huh. I wanted to make sure that this book could be left on the coffee table. 
and a young person could pick it up and the uh, adults in the room wouldn't have to go, <gasps> oh, wait, wait, yes, put yes. that down. Um, <laughs> anything that's in there that we know, the things that do happen to the slaves is suggested, such as she says, he took what didn't belong to him. Yeah. We know what he took. Right. And everything doesn't have to be spelled out. So, right. And it's still mm -hmm. exciting. Yes. And, so. and when we talk about the narrative, the written narrative of the African-American, when do you see that as a presence in society? When did you see the writing occur? Was it in the 1900s, in the 1950s? When does the spoken and written word start occurring? Obviously not during the slave years, but what do you see in, in your research that you've done? Well, actually, we know Frederick Douglass yes. was mm -hmm. writing, and it was mm -hmm. during the slave years, so there were slaves. Remember, the fate of a slave was totally dependent on its owners. Some owners educated their slaves, and if the owner themselves didn't, sometimes the owner's children educated the slaves. Yes. Sometimes mm -hmm. the slaves stood by the, the uh, child that was being educated, and yes. in turn, he received that education. Yes. So different circumstances uh, occurred for the slaves, but some of them were able mm -hmm. to read and write. And Frederick Douglass is considered one of the greatest orators. Hmm. How about with churches? Because I know that the, the blacks were very much a religious people, Yes, in their own right, and then they got forced into churches, uh, and with the indoctrination of, you know, the King James version version of the Bible, did that help educate them further as well? Uh, the Bible we know was used as an educational tool, but remember, it was the slave owner who determined what they would if they would learn or not mm -hmm. and sometimes the bible was used as a teaching tool uh -huh. but that wasn't a common thing that uh -huh. was just at the whim mm -hmm. of an owner mm -hmm. because there were slaves who were caught reading and their eyes were put out yes oh. yes so uh it goes the pendulum can swing from one end all the way to the other yeah, but you can't speak of education mm -hmm. as a common as mm -hmm. a common factor because the lack of education is what made it possible mm -hmm. to keep people in bondage. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so reading becomes writing, and then that's when the freedom actually occurs. Yes, and when a slave learns to read or write, the next thing they do is seek their freedom. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we know there were the songs sung in the field. We know that there were quilts made and hung on the lines mm. that had messages. We know that there were there was drumming and pounding that brought messages. So the slaves knew when the Underground Railroad was coming through, when it was safe to run, when it wasn't safe to run. Yes. So. Uh, Yes, education makes a difference. Mm -hmm. I know when I was growing up, I always assumed that the slave issue was always confined to the southern states. But I know now, after education, that that was not true. It was um, certainly into the Midwest, up to Kansas, and certainly along the East Coast, uh, Virginia, places like that. Um, it was very pervasive, and the money to maintain that society, that um, degrative society, was given to, to the United States from other countries, such as England and Canada, because they wanted to maintain trade and commerce for the slave trade, because that's where the commerce was maintained. Yes, and the slavery in the North was different from the slavery in the midway down, when we talk about Kentucky, Tennessee, was different from the slavery in the Mason-Dixon, down through the Delta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The further north you went, the fewer slaves there were. Right. Because they didn't have 
they didn't have the land, they didn't have plantations, they didn't have farms. They What they needed was someone to do the cooking, the cleaning, the child care, and what we as housewives do today. That's yes. what they needed slaves for. Mm. Yes. Mm. When you get down to Kentucky, you have uh, slave owners. They may have as many as five slaves. And uh, But they needed their slaves on the farm. Mm -hmm. But after the harvest in the fall, they were sent north to work, and that money was sent back to them. Yes. Because the northerners would need someone to help in the kitchen to do the laundry and what have you. When you get down south, which was always a threat to the slaves, mm -hmm. if they don't do what they're told to do, they'll be shipped south. And no slave wanted to go south. That was the cotton picking and even more grueling, the sugar plantations. Mm -hmm. And those are huge plantations. Uh, there was uh, a guy who had 1,300 acres, and we go, wow. But then there was another who had thousands. Mm -hmm. yeah. Plantations so large, you would find hospitals on the plantations, mm -hmm. churches on the plantations, and, other, and so many out structures that to meet the needs of those slaves to keep them in, in, the, uh, in the fields. Well, up, uptown in Kentucky, they had more slaves than they could use. The women were having slaves. The women were healthier so they could breed. The women down south, they weren't able to have their babies because they were so overworked. Yeah, exhausted. S yes, so yeah. malnourished. So, so then you, you, look, you, you look at them and they're dying. So what happens is the slave owners send their worker to Kentucky, which is a breeding state and known for its quality of slaves and purchase their slaves mm -hmm. and bring them back down south. What was, what was uh, making these demands? The cotton down south was flourishing. Yeah. And then... Well, what did they need with uh, hemp? Hemp was the driving crop in Kentucky. It was making the economy boom. Yes. That's what you used to make <laughs> those burlap sacks that they put in those cotton balls in. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is the hemp was used by the Navy for ropes. Yeah, I was going to say. Yes. And so the demand of the hemp and the demand for the co cotton drove the demand for slavery. slavery. And so the slaves and the slave owners, that was a business. And it, and it ran almost unobstructed for years and years and years and years. Oh, yes. Until, as we know, we ended up with the Civil War. And even after that, unfortunately, and you know more about that than maybe most, unfortunately. Well, we do know that uh, the word didn't get to everyone that slavery was over, so it did uh, flow over uh, in a few more years for some people. But yes, uh, slavery ended with the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say that in Kentucky, you, you hear the word plantation, you hear the word farms. In Kentucky, they had farms. The wealthier plantation owners like Henry Clay, their farms were generally 600 acres. Yes. And they planted hemp, whereas down south they had many, many, many more. But not only did they plant hemp, they might plant corn, they might plant tobacco, they might plant more than one uh, crop. Down south it was a cotton plantation or it was a sugar cane plantation. Mm -hmm. And uh, which required many, many, many more slaves. Well, I know you have passages in your book that you would like to read. Yes. So um, if you could just a bit, maybe you can kind I of... I would uh, to give you just... Um, help the narrative? Just a, a flavor of what you might find in the book. Um, there was an auction, Clarissa, 
and her son, George Henry, who had been separated from the family in, uh, at the auction in Louisville. She was separated from her twin daughters who were taken to St. Louis. Her older son, she never knew where he went, what, what uh, state or city he went to, and her, uh, he wasn't her husband, but the man that was given to her that acted as her husband, they never knew what happened to poor old Jake. So this is um, after the auction and a long ride in an oxen cart where Mullins arrives at his farm with his two new hands. And this is the woman, and she's referred to as the woman because she has no identity, and her boy. Ben sprung from the wagon bench with the zest of a child, eager to see his mother after being separated for some time. He knocked at Effie's door, the only barrier in the slave quarters that he respected. When it opened, the woman was sure that she saw an angel who wore a soft white apron, fluttering like cream flowing from a milk can. The angel greeted Mullins graciously, Evening, Massa. Her voice was more musical than Miss Betsy's harp, the wife of the man who owned, who owned the woman and her boy before they were auctioned off. Glad to be back and be done with my work, Mammy. That's what he called Effie since she, was, since she had nursed him from the time he was a young boy in knickers and long stockings. He continued calling her Mammy after putting on his first pair of Mammy uh, manly britches. <laughs> it was a grueling mm. three weeks. I got a couple of new ones. Margaret's going to like them. That is, he paused, smiled at Effie, and then respectfully lowered his eyes after you've taken care of them. His mood shifted as he thrusted his head back, aiming it at the new gal and her boy. He yanked the woman who attempted to stand but instead tumbled into his arms. With a sweep of his hand, he brushed her away like filth clinging to his, clinging to his coat. The woman floundered, but remained on her feet. She lifted her troubling boy, her, she lifted her trembling boy and the quilt from the wagon to the ground. So Very descriptive. So that's, uh, and I knew from my family's history that he had taken uh, my great my great grandfather and his mother Clarissa by oxen cart. Uh -huh. So I knew that that's how they they traveled from when they were auctioned to the farm. But I'd like to read the uh, first the first paragraph of the book. What's interesting about this paragraph is that it was it's from the auction and it was in the center of the book. And one thing as writers that we want to do is when your potential reader opens your book, it grabs them. Yes. yes. And hopefully doesn't let them go. Yeah. I'm going to read this in, uh, in first person. I leaned against the rear of the auction block. My small boy squatted at my feet bundled in the quilt that had been handed down woman to woman in my family befuddled. I studied the surface of the block, polished by damp feet, marred by shackles, stained with blood and punctuated with bits of flesh. I closed my eyes. Recollection of my family being sold raced through my mind. My man Jake, buried with age and wore out. My boy Toby, with the butterfly birthmark, on the back of his neck, and my Gail, Gail's Mary and Molly, wrapped together, bounded as one, as I shifted my focus to Ben Mullins. He bees my new owner. I stand in here. I scared. I watched him. I watches him. He's a-stepping between them slaves like he's gonna buy another. I don't know where I is. I don't know where I's going. I holds my boy, we shaking, we shaking terribly. Then the master he come, throws us up in the back of a ox cart. I scared. He throws them scabers blankets 
throws them down on us. They be itching. I pushes my quill between my boy and them blankets. That horse and cart, it be taking off. It be going down that lane, taking me to, I, I, I don't know where, but taking me away from what I be knowing. So. <gasps> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. So. I have to clap. This is radio. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm going to clap for you. So. There you go. And what uh, that is the first person interpretive program that comes from this story, and it is recognized by the National Underground Network to Freedom U.S. Park Service. And that allows me to use their logos, and you will find me listed online in, at, on the website. Mm. So. The visualiz visualization of standing on the block with the blood, with the uh, marks from the shackles, uh, the sweat. I can't even vis I can visualize, but can't visualize standing there barefooted, scared to death. I, they couldn't have been anything less than scared to death. They were, they were, and when, in the book, when her twin daughters were being sold away from yeah. her, she's rocking, she's reeling, she's literally pulling her hair out. Yeah. Because uh, this family has been together from owner to owner. They were lucky when they moved that they were sold together. Yes. And they get here, and she is separated from her family. And she sees her, Master Montgomery. Master Montgomery, sir, please, sir, sells us together. And he doesn't. Yeah. And she's left with, uh, with, with the uh, Toby. And then she watches him go. She watches the twins go. Please, sir, don't take my man Jake away from me. And she's begging yeah. that she be able to hold on to those members of her family. Yeah. And. This happened over and over and over. And it's hard for us today to 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 realize how painful this can be. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't visualize. Well, in your narrative you mention over a couple of times the Underground Railroad. Um I know we have a understanding we think of what that is, but can you explain it a little more? Well, the Underground Railroad is not uh, literally a train moving along. <laughs> it's, right. it's people moving along, and the slaves are running away with the help of conductors. Those are the people who lead them along the way. Yes. And takes them from l station to station, which might be a house, a house, where there are abolitionists who help them to get to the next station. Yes. And so it's more of an analogy using the train. That's correct. Yes. And uh, some say there was a slave named Trice who was running from his master, crosses the Ohio River, and, he's, and he follows behind him. He says he disappears as if he was on a train. Yeah, yeah. So then there's uh, the Underground Railroad kind of came out of that. That's one of the stories we really don't know and it wasn't stated as being factual. Yeah. I read a little bit about Sojourner, the uh, woman who was probably yes. very influential and um, her struggle not only for her own freedom but to help others gain theirs. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming she's part of that Underground Railroad. Oh, most definitely. She led so many slaves across the uh, Ohio River, and she wasn't, you know, she wasn't a, a really big woman, and uh, she, but she was so successful in her endeavor. Oh, she's a great personality uh, in the history of slavery and the movement of slaves. And remember that in 1793, the slaves were running away, and this was the first Fugitive Slave Act. Mm -hmm. And the Fugitive Slave Act said, if you, uh, if you get a slave, you've got to send them back. If you capture them, you have to send them back. Well, that didn't quite work, and the slaves kept running away. Mm -hmm. So then in 1850, there was a fugitive, a, a, a fugitive Slave 
act that was passed that forced the, cis, the citizens to assist in the capture of those slaves. Oh. And if they didn't return them, they were fined. Yeah. And uh, that, so crossing the Ohio River didn't always make it a sure bet that you would be free and not sent back. So in my book, remember, my characters have to cross the Ohio River. So my book is 1846 to 1856. Uh, mm -hmm. In 1856, the river was frozen because we know that that's when Margaret Garner crossed the river. Mm -hmm. So that was the year that the slaves in my story Cross the, the river, river. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and that's how you know. I like to connect my story to history. That's why I say, when you read it, you will you will see the the truth in the story. So you're saying the people crossing over to freedom, the African Americans obviously took quite a risk, but the people that helped them also could be prosecuted. Oh yes, if they helped them caught uh, and were caught with the slaves and they didn't return them there were penalties to be paid yes indeed so they yeah. uh it made it difficult so at that time during that time slaves are just bleeding out of the south they, they're just coming up and they're crossing the ohio river they had to have this fugitive slave act to kind of plug that hole because it was having an impact on the state's income right mm -hmm. Yep. And it, they had to stop it. That made it difficult for Clarissa and George Henry to run because the slave owners were keeping an extra eye on their slaves because Kentucky is a border state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The river freezes and is close to Ohio and Cincinnati, just, just, just across the bridge. That's right. And the slaves yeah. did run usually in the winter, because uh, the river would, would be frozen in places. And so you're saying that the African Americans are now a little more educated, and they understand that there is freedom basically across the river. So they now have a, um, if you want to say, a train to get there, the Underground Railroad. The information is flowing. They want to make the risk they take advantage of the Underground Railroad, and they want to go north to freedom. That's right. And remember, the message came through the songs. Oh. Yes. The education came through the songs because they couldn't, they couldn't sit in a group and chat. That was against the law. Right. No, no gathering. Because <laughs> the uh, owners felt that was a threat and that they would run away. Mm. So they sung their songs, and... They were like warning, go down Moses, way down in Egypt's land. And you could just hear these songs carrying the messages out mm -hmm. to the other slaves. Yes. So they couldn't read and they couldn't write. But they learned that that Big Dipper was up there. They knew about the Big Dipper. They knew how the moss grew on the trees. Yes. And they... Well, we know in many cases they were very successful. Everybody didn't get caught. Mm -hmm. They're very intelligent. We just yes. weren't giving them the credit. Well, you see, we, we were confused because they didn't look like the master. Master. They didn't talk like the master. Right. They didn't have a command of the English language. But what he didn't know is in their land they were brilliant people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Some of them were kings, queens, prince, and princesses. And they were intelligent yes. in their own country. Yes. And they, we even have stories of many, many of the uh, slaves who became spies. Yeah. They didn't write everything down, but had incredible recall and were very, very helpful. The, the stories and the songs that they brought with them and kept them alive for so many, many years after being brought here uh, also helped educate well, them. In, in America and in the British colonies, they were not allowed to speak their language. So they weren't singing it either. These are songs that came along with 
the came along with slavery. In South America, such as in Brazil, they were allowed to speak their language and continue with their culture. And you can go there today, and there is a Yoruba colony from uh, Nigeria. They speak Yoruba. They eat the Yoruba foods. They practice the Yoruba mm. culture. Uh -huh. But here in America, no. Mm -hmm. They weren't allowed to do that. I have one more question maybe that we haven't talked about. Um, was the slave owner always the white man and the slave always the African American? Is that how it always was? No. Uh, but primarily it was, but in some states, you, you know, in St. Louis and in New Orleans, there were uh, African American aristocrats who owned slaves. My heavens. African Americans owned African Americans? Mm -hmm. So we did have some of that right mm. here. How did that how did that come about? Well, uh in both New Orleans, St. Louis, the uh the settlers would take a mulatto woman to be his concubine and actually set her up in a family family style. They would have children, he would buy a house for her and what have you. And they would inherit, she would inherit that house. Oh. Occasionally, occasionally, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> he would inherit the house, and occasionally he would marry her. And this population began to grow and thrive. And they had, they would have balls, they were educated, they had money. And some of the men were barbers and got rich being a barber, uh -huh. what we would consider rich at that time for them. So these communities developed and thrived. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about where we can find your book, because this is, this is so very interesting. Oh, you can find it on Amazon.com. Mm-hmm. You can um, contact me at J Camille C A M I L L E at Anike Press A N I K E Press P R E S S dot com and request an autographed copy and uh, mm -hmm. and I'll be glad to get it out to you if you want me to come to. Uh, do a program for you. I can do that. I have many programs. This book also has a storytelling quilt with a poem, has a teacher's uh, guide, and it has and it has. I mm -hmm. saw you had something online called Kaleidoscope. Oh, Kaleidoscope Kids. Oh, yes. And that has a coloring book with it. This is a story about kids from around the world. This is for your uh, younger reader, and okay. it's more geared towards a middle grade reader, although it may have to have help from the parents because of the names of the children. The names are real. Okay. Uh -huh. So the names come from all around the world, uh, <laughs> too. But this is a book that uh, helps to teach tolerance and understanding of other cultures. Mm -hmm. And it has a story with a project that all of these kids work on. They, they, they create an American flag and end up with it in a parade. Okay. Beautiful story. So I yeah. think we're about uh, toward the end of our time. Unfortunately, we are yeah. getting there. Yes. <laughs> well, Jen and I would like to thank you so much, Judith. Owens La Dude. <laughs> Um, and James is going to come back in a week or so. He's just taken a little hiatus. To learn more about our show, please go to aspectsofwriting.com. There where you will find links to our syndicated show on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Apple, Roku TV, and amfm247.com. And our 14 terrestrial stations, as well as the link to your YouTube channel. 
The show is syndicated on the AMFM 24-7 network. Until next week, as James always reminds us, if you can dream it, you can write it. That's right. Thank you very much. Ladies, it has been an education. Judith, I thank you so very much, and happy uh, uh, Black History Month. Thank you. Everybody. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks again.